Marcion of Sinope and Gnosticism. And um, I wrote my honors thesis on circumcision at Corinth. So lots of fun stuff. <laughs> so do you think that the Marcionites were Gnostics? No, I don't. Um, okay. Basically, the big problem I'm having is that anyone who studies Marcion in the big academic world who writes books about him comes to that conclusion. But mainstream scholars who write general introductions or scholars who have like much more broad introductory interests basically lump him there as well. And it's a bit of a misnomer, and I wish people would stop doing it. So I'm trying to write the definitive piece of saying, guys, cut it out. He wasn't a Gnostic. Gotcha. Cool, that sounds interesting. Thank you. Um, have you ever, by chance, read Legends of Genesis by Herman Gunkel? I have not. Okay. Well, um, I'll just use that as our segue since we're live now. Um, do you know much about this Hangout? Did Ruben tell you anything about it? No, I just got invited. Um, clearly, I was somewhat entertaining last time, but... Uh, um, oh, yeah, well, we love to have new people, especially people who, you know, have education in this field, so... Um, basically, the group is... Um, we're going to be doing biblical scholarship reading from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and then peripheral stuff, too, like maybe church history or even first century... Um, um, Palestinian history, whatever. It basically, it doesn't have to be directly related, but somehow related. Yeah, um, and this is our first book. We're doing Legends of Genesis by Herman Gunkel. And I forget, Wayne, did you remember the exact date he wrote this? I think it was 1906 or something like that. He, he's the guy who came up primarily with the four document hy uh, hypothesis, right? Or the, the no, background. that was Wellhausen, yeah. That was Wellhausen. Um, Gunkel came up with form criticism, which was looking at like the literary forms of the legends and trying to approach them in that direction. Um, so last week we went over chapters one and two, which basically talked... The first one was kind of an introductory, where he gave us types of the legends. So in general, they're all fall under an umbrella term which he called etiological, which means they have some explanatory function. Like, um, they're, they're geographical legends where, uh, for example, the story of Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. <clears throat> He's saying that that was, you know, this is all in his view, by the way. We're not necessarily taking it for granted. We're just reading it, and then we can discuss what we think of his theories. But he was arguing that, you know, this probably came about to explain some uh, geological phenomena like a, some kind of pillar looking thing a rock formation and they this story came about to, to um, describe that um, and he get, he goes through examples of um, genealogical legends where the uh, um, tribal patriarchs were actually just really representations of the tribes themselves and not actual people. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head some of the other legends he goes through. Actually, I have the book in front of me. I'll just knock them off. So people that are tuning in for this episode will actually get kind of a catch-up and for anybody else in here. Like, I know, Abel, you said you didn't get to read much of it. Mm -hmm. um, he also talks about, in the first two chapters... Things like we, he says, we seem to see a difference in the way that how God inter in the stories interacts with um, the world. He says in the earlier forms of the legends, God is a more immediate presence. Like in the Garden of Eden, he gives that example right away. God literally walks in the garden, talks with Adam and Eve directly. I mean, he's present in the world. And later on, he's saying that the, you can identify a later legend because by that time, the Israelites had had a more abstract um, kind of, uh, yeah, basically abstract um, conception of, of God. And he was more, um, he, was, he wasn't as immediately present in the world. So Yeah, God, make, God, God gets more was, associated up in the heaven. God is in heaven much more and speaking down to people and 
like whenever whenever the prophets want to talk to God, it's very they have to climb mountains and get higher and things like that. But previously, God just he literally enjoys the cool of the garden and he can walk around and and right. God has very much like um, you know the bow of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, very like actually identifiable items belonging to a person. Um, but then later, yeah, yeah, it's pretty standard theological developments, you know. Uh, yeah, so that basically he try, he tries to identify the more primeval forms of the legends based off of the immediate interaction of God, and then the later ones tend to be more remote. Like he's he has some intermediary, an angel, a messenger, a, a prophet in an ecstatic state or a dream or something like that. Um, he also talks about, um, yeah, he, he describes that whole process as waning anthropomorphism. So God becomes less and less anthropomorphic and more and more abstract and distant, in a sense, less immediate. Um, and now he goes in, then he goes into the varieties of legends. So um, he talks about... Um, the patriarchs represent tribes. Um, I'm just flipping through real quick. Forgive me. Goal legends. Um, so there is a desire to know the reasons for the relations of the tribes. So he he asks questions like why? Or, or sorry, the some of these are meant to answer questions like why is Cain in the servant of his brother? Oh, buzz there. Hmm. Uh, the question is like, why is Cain in the servant of his brethren? Why has Japheth such an extended territory? Why do the children of Lot dwell in the inhospitable east? So the, the legends um, um, represent the tribes in the form of a character, and these stories are meant to explain why these tribal situations and relationships exist. That's an ethnological legend. Then he talks about etymological legends, like why are certain places called this? Um, he talks about ceremonial legends. Why do we have certain holidays? Why do we have these ceremonies or rituals? Um, then he, he talks, I already mentioned geological legends. He talks about oftentimes the legends will be mixed. You'll find different forms of legends combined together into one narrative. Um, and that's basically chapters one and two. That's pretty much what he's describing. So um, we just started this week reading chapters three and four. Um, did anyone have any comments on that, by the way? Just to review. Hmm. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, so yeah, this week we did chapters 3 and 4, which chapter 3 is the literary form of the legends, and chapter 4, which I forget the name of it, let me go to it real quick. Sorry, flipping through the PDF. Yeah, uh, history and the development of the legends in oral tradition. So... Um, I'm going to go back to literary. So um, for the people who did do the reading, I know, Wayne, you did Chapter 3. What did you think overall of Chapter 3, the literary, his literary identification of the legends? Um, I'm still trying to process it overall, but I think there's a lot of interesting points he makes. It just There's things I highlighted in the text that I'm still having to ponder through my mind what to really make of it all. I kind of think I need to look at the actual commentary itself and see how he applies some of this particular stories. Yeah. And by the way, for any people who don't already know, this Ledge of Genesis is actually an excerpt from a larger work he did called Just Genesis, which is his whole form-critical approach to the book of Genesis. Um, yeah, I felt the same way about Chapter 3. I thought that... It was really interesting, but I thought that some of his criteria were a little slippery, maybe, or not necessarily as universally applicable 
But he did, in fairness, a lot of times after he described it, he would go on to note exceptions to them. So, you know. I have to mention, there's some parts where I thought I knew the story, and then he makes the comment about the story. I say, oh, I know that's not true. And then I try, kind of put a little sticky note in the PDF, you know, of my remarks on it. But when I go back and actually check the text and look at it more carefully, I think, wait a second. My memory of what the text said is not exactly the same as what the text actually says. And he might actually be right on some things. Yeah. Like, one thing that caught me that I didn't realize wasn't there is explaining God's motivation in the Garden of Eden, you know, for telling him not to eat the fruit. To me, it seemed obvious. I, I thought from the verse later in the passage, God was basically jealous of man becoming like, like him and didn't want that to happen. So he gives them the lie about the fruit being poisonous. Um, the serpent, basically, which is probably an original form of the legend, I would think, is another God who just wants to, you know, not allow God to lie to Adam and Eve. Um, basically tells them th points that the story later bears out. I mean, they live hundreds of years afterwards. They don't die. They do gain knowledge from the tree. Basically, everything the serpent says comes true according to the narration of the passage. So the, the whole idea that the serpent is evil or the serpent is trying to deceive is simply just not there in Genesis at all. Yeah, the serp yeah Reuben says, right, the serpent doesn't lie in the story strictly reading from the text, the serpent actually doesn't lie. The other interesting thing, too, is God says, in that day you will surely die, or something to that effect. But but really, it's, it's interesting, because in order for them to have stayed alive, they had to continually eat from the tree of life. Not from the tree of knowledge. Remember, there's two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. They had to actually eat the fruit of the tree of life continuously, to, to so they weren't automatically immortal. Um, they had to, and so in other words, God basically cut them off from access to the tree of life, and so therefore, from that moment forward, they would eventually die. Um, and the serpent was right in that said, "You will gain knowledge. You will, um, you will, uh, you know, you'll know good and evil. You'll become like a god." And God says, "You know." They've become like one of us, you know. They've got they've gotten knowledge. They've become like one of us. But yeah. Duncan, Go ahead. I think the story bears out that Gunkel's kind of right that this storyteller in Genesis likes to report the action and kind of never really mentions very well characters' motivations. They're just to be assumed from the characters' actions. Right. That's one of the other things. Um, that you just mentioned that he that's what big focus he has is there's not generally but a lot there's a lack of the narrator giving us information on the thoughts and mindset of the characters in the stories and they're actually conveyed just through action so whereas in a modern a more modern writing we would definitely see um, a description of the mindset or state of mind or emotional standpoint of the character in the story, and he says that these earlier legends tend not to have that. It's all done through the action of the characters. What's interesting? Uh, I did. Have, I did have, is, go ahead. Uh, I just found that what's interesting is um, the one of the people who does have lots of the actions is the woman, the, the female character, because she sees that the fruit is good, and you know she's the one who gives. The, to her, you know, the woman figure plays a, out of these active roles. She plays an, an incredibly active role, and she's the one who engages dialogue with the snake. She's the one who sees what it is and like actually touches it and gives it to her husband. So, what's interesting is that um, out of all these roles, it's the female figure who, you know, really takes the lead. Yeah. That's regarding, a point, yeah. regarding a different legend in Genesis, um, Dunkel brings up the point that the writer is very terse and on detail and usually only inserts details that actually have good significance to the story. So I'm curious in the story of the um, the sacrifice or the God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, 
um, why the two servants are mentioned. There's actually a couple verses dedicated to talking about the two servants they bring with them, which is another of those details <coughs> that the text mentions them, but I forget that's even there. I don't think a lot of popular accounts even mention the servants. They're usually left out entirely. Yeah. But that just, just, it just struck me as interesting that what do they add to the story there? There might be something that I'm missing. Do they do something for Abraham, like help him prepare for the trip up the mountain? I forget. Yeah, I, I they, they, they carry the wood originally before Abraham gives the wood to, uh, to Isaac to carry. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting, too. Um, so I'll just go down some of my notes. So basically the whole chapter is dealing with the literary characteristics of these different legends. Um, so the first thing he says is, he's saying Genesis is prose, not poetry, with the exception of chapter 40, or something in the chapter 49, I forget exactly what it was. Yeah, ch chapter, he says chapter 49 is a poem, not a narrative, whereas the rest of the book is prose, not poetry. Um, and he argues that he thinks the most primitive forms of these legends not the forms we have them in, the, the earlier forms, would have been probably, possibly hymns, some of them would have been hymns, or would have been poetic, and a lot of them had gotten turned into prose form when they had been written down, essentially. So there, it's all oral tradition, you have hymns, poetry, and then as it gets written down, a lot of it gets converted into narrative prose, rather than remaining as poetry. Is the Epic of Gilgamesh poetry? I haven't actually read it myself. I think I've heard that it is. But I'm yeah, not I, I think it is pretty much poetic form, yeah. Um, he also says, yeah, the legends developed originally as oral tradition. I don't think really anyone disputes that. Um, some originate as hymns. And then he talks about this thing, these things called legend cycles. And this is where you have a bunch of isolated legends originally that ended up getting tied together um, into a longer complete narrative um, and he gives a couple examples let me flip to the text there yeah, he says in later times there were formed of these individual legends greater units called legend cycles in which the separate legends are more or less artistically combined um, and then he, he gives examples Thus, the legend cycle which treats Abraham and Lot separates clearly into the following stories. So these would be the separate legends. One, the migration of Abraham and Lot to Canaan. Two, their separation at Bethel. Three, the theophany at Hebron, so that's God's appearance. Four, the destruction of Sodom. Five, the birth of Ammon and Moab. Six, the birth of Isaac. So there's one example of a general phenomena that he's arguing is present in Genesis and that these individual legends have gotten strung together into a, a narrative arc, basically. Any thoughts on that idea? Do you agree with it? Does it seem plausible? Does it seem far-fetched? Or how can we possibly know? What do you guys think about that? I think it seems entirely plausible. Um, the question of whether it's actually the case, what kind of evidence would we look for to confirm it? Yeah, that's one of the general thoughts I had on chapter 3 was uh, a lot of this just seemed, and you know, sometimes we have to just be satisfied with basically giving it our best shot at an educated guess because you know, we just don't have a lot of external information from the text. We're just dealing with the text and that's it. So you know, we can't go back in time and look at it interview the writers or developers of these stories. But it seemed plausible to me you know, that you could have uh, originally disparate legends strung together later on to make a larger story. Um, but the opposite seems just as plausible to me also, that they're, just, they're all come from a single origin together. So. Yeah, that's possible. It's possible too. both yeah. ways. I don't know how to decide. And I'm not going to read the whole part section, but he does go into some. For anyone interested that hasn't read it already, he does go into his arguments as why he thinks we can identify 
what were originally separate legends that were strung together. Like he 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 does more than just claim that that's what it was. He does give some arguments, and then you know you guys can decide if you find them uh, plausible or not. Um, and then he talks about. Um, This this tendency uh, on a lot of the legends to focus on one particular I don't want to say emotion of a character but a, a particular feeling for the whole story um, he gives example of it too um, thus in the story of the sacrifice of Isaac emotion is predominant in that of Jacob's description of Isaac humor in the story of Sodom moral earnestness in the story of Babel, the fear of the Almighty. So all these legends, take all these stories taken alone, tend to have a general, I wouldn't say emotion, but theme to them, basically. The, the problem I have with that is like, that is, it, it, it's a good idea, but it's a bit dubious, because much like sermon writing, you can take so many themes and so many ideas and so many um, traits. Um, it really is in the beholder of, you know, it's really in the commentator who's going to draw out those themes. Um, like, you know, taking Sodom and Gomorrah is like, is the theme hospitality? Like, you, you should give hospitality to the alien no matter what, even at the risk of your own you know, daughters' lives, mm -hmm. um, or is the theme God's judgment against the wicked, how strong God, you know, like what, you know, to me it depends, it, much like someone writing a sermon, it really depends what their perception is. So I have a bit of an issue with that. It's a good idea, but a bit of an issue. Yeah, I agree, and it seems like he almost contradicts himself in a way because he argues this as an example, but then he talks earlier in the in chapter two and later on in this chapter about the legends being mixed and that you can have multiple rhetorical purposes or messages or themes all present in one narrative story. Like you said, in the case of Sodom and it could be uh, hospitality is super critically important and you better fear God because this is what can happen if you don't you know, obey his his commandments and all that stuff. So he, he does mention that, but then he says this kind of stuff, and it's like, well, wait, that doesn't exactly jive with what he said earlier. Hmm. So I did notice sometimes he he kind of, not necessarily contradicts himself, but kind of undermines what he may have said later or earlier. Um, he also says that the characters tend to be very limited and that each of the narratives typically focuses on a chief character and superfluous characters are never really introduced. Um, it really kind of just focuses mainly on that one character and um, basically that they're character wise the stories are very efficient. They're very parsimonious. They don't just, you know, you don't just get a, a ton of unnecessary um, complications of characters and stuff like that, which I guess is pretty straightforward. I don't really have a problem with that. It's basic storytelling, I think. <laughs> yeah, I agree with him on that for the most part, but that's why the the servants and the Abraham sacrificing Isaac seem to strike me as a strange exception to that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, they don't. I mean, he could have just had, he could have done away with them easily wouldn't have changed the story, I don't think. Um, he also taught, mentions that the physical descriptions of the characters are oftentimes very quick, barely any info, or sometimes even completely lacking. Like, I think, who is it Esau who's, like, described as ha very hairy, right? Is that Esau? I think that's Esau. Um... Yes. And, uh, but in general, 
you, we don't really get any kind of information on the physical characteristics. What color hair did they have? What color eyes did they have? Were they big and burly? Were they skinny little twerps? You know what? You know, we don't. We don't. We're, we we have a, a complete lack of that sort of information in general. And then he goes on to mention some exceptions. And says that later on, the later legends tend to do have more embellishments like that. In the case of Esau, he's hairy in order that um, his father can feel him later on. And, and uh, that okay. his brother can impersonate that feeling in the story by putting the skins of animals and stuff on. So that detail is relevant to the plot. Yeah, gotcha. So that explains why it's included. Okay. That's a good point. Well, something like... Um uh, something I've been studying recently, which goes way beyond Genesis, but it's interesting that um, Acts of the Apostles never describes Paul, never yeah. gives a description of what Paul looks like. But when you get to the Acts of Paul and Thecla in the middle of the second century, Paul's described as having a monobrow, and he's bald, and he's like thin and gang like, and what a lot of scholars have noticed is that Paul in this has the descriptions of a great philosopher. He's a like a, a great platonic figure, I yeah. know. Um, and there's embellishment there for the purpose of symbolic, you know, legendary material. And you know, it, I, I think it's quite typical in the early sort of primitive for the lack of a better word, stages of these stories that they don't want. And something that's interesting that um, I think it's Campbell, uh, Joseph Campbell on myth making, um, he talks about in um, um, uh, one of his big Mask of God books that it gives freedom to the storyteller to embellish as they, as they will until eventually that is crystallized in literary form. So when it's all, when it's vocalized, the storyteller has the power to make Abraham look whatever he wants Abraham to look like. But when the story is crystallized in pen and paper, you know, that's, that's the defining moment. So are you saying that, let's say some ancient Israelite was t telling the story of Abraham so that he would have the freedom to give these kinds of d details, but that the writer, when he was writing down the, the basic framework of the story, he left them out? Is that what you're saying? That's Campbell's theory on just general myth-making. Like, oh, okay. Um, that's, you know, I, whether I subscribe to it, I, I don't know. It's one of those things where I'm a bit... I, I just don't know how we can we can figure this sort of stuff out, particularly when we get this ancient. Um, it's a good theory, but how do you prove it? But, you know. Yeah, I agree. In, in general, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of the problem with these is we are basically stuck with kind of making our best guesses, and we have to be satisfied with that and just weigh the plausibility of each of these, you know. But when I asked earlier, you know, how to prove it, I, I wasn't being that pessimistic. I was actually thinking there could actually be answers to that question. I don't have one in mind right now, though, but some of this stuff we can bring up evidence for, and that's the most interesting thing. Yeah, and some of the things seem way more likely than others. Like, some seem really clear um, to me, like certain of his types of legends, like the the... the the patriarchs being representations of the tribes as a whole, and the um, ethnological legends where the the patriarch, the representative of the tribe, things happen in his life that end up describing the current situation of a tribe. You know, like it said, why? Um, well, I forget the exact examples, but why is this tribe living here in the inhospitable desert? Well, this is why, because this patriarch did this and this and that, and he ended up living in the desert, you know? So I, I think those are very, very plausible, whereas some of these other things, like the, we, the thing we just mentioned, that Daniel mentioned, yeah, those are kind of more on shaky ground. But still fun to talk about and guess and come up with ideas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What else are, we, what else are you going to do on a Sunday? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. 
What else are you going to do on a Sunday? Yep. Um, uh, so, yeah, we did characters' thoughts. Um, yeah, he says a real, a, a real conspicuous thing is the characters' thoughts, not just their emotions, but their thoughts themselves, we rarely hear about them in the, er the primitive forms of the legends. Um, like Wayne said earlier, it's all done through the actions of the story. And he says it's really odd because especially in more modern writings, we get that all the time. We get thoughts of the characters given to us, given to the reader by the author. So he says that's another mark of quote-unquote primitive storytelling. Uh, another thing is we, you know, we already talked about the lack of the physical characteristics of characters, but we also have a lack of descriptive detail of places in general. Like, for example, imagine today if we were writing about the Garden of Eden, who wouldn't give us a nice description of the lushness of the garden, the, t the trees in it, rivers, all that stuff? Like, it's pretty. Stark, we don't really know what the garden looks like. And he says this is also another sign of a primitive kind of legend, basically, that there's just a general lack of descriptive detail, especially where more modern, not necessarily modern, but more modern from the time of these legends, they, it's full of that type of stuff, you know. It seems irresistible to the author not to include it, like a description of the Garden of Eden. Yeah, a well, lot of what Gunk yeah, was describing, yes. apply go ahead. As um, Doug was talking about earlier, um, that the oral storyteller can embellish the story with a lot of detail, but when these stories were written down, people didn't have unlimited amounts of paper and pen and ink available to them to just write volumes of detail into the stories. If you're if you're limited to a scroll, think about texting. How different is something that you text to somebody versus something that you tell to somebody? When you have a limited amount of space and perhaps it's onerous to actually have to write these things down, then you're going to leave out a lot of details that aren't really important because you're trying to get everything down within the space and within, you know, I guess, Human ener the limitations of human energy, especially if you're back in times of, say, scrolls were somewhat limited, but even more limited would be, say, clay tablets, when people were having to, you know, punch out the letters with little sticks and stuff. When you've got something mm -hmm. like that, you're going you're gonna to try to get it down as terse as possible. That's a great point, and I think that may undermine some of his criteria of identifying primordial or primitive forms of a legend because that's a great point. I mean, it may just have been, like you said, they just were limited in scroll length or it was, it was not convenient for them to have super long scrolls and codices and stuff like that or tons of clay tablets. That's a really good point. That's, that's an excellent point and it also fits in with what Wayne was talking about before is that if there is a descriptive figure only because it serves the plot. Like, like, the reason why his hairiness is identified is because it's later used in the story. Right? So yeah, I think that's that's a really good point, Sean. And good to yeah. see you again. I might want to also mention that it's a possibility that some of these legends were not merely written on like clay tablets or scrolls, but maybe even on the walls of temples. I mean, we know that was done like in Egypt. So how yeah. much space they have on a pillar to put a story could be part of the question. Yeah. I still think there's something to it, but I'm not sure. I, I think Shauna's point can ca could cast a lot of doubt on uh, some of these criteria for the, in general, the terseness of what we're getting, like to use Shauna's word. Um, but like you said earlier, Daniel, in the case of Acts, you know, we're not given a single description of Paul. You know, no, we don't know anything about what he looks like. You know, and not too much time later, and this is, you know, the Acts of the Acts was written. You know, there's a lot of scholars differ, but some say, you know, 
you know, I don't know, it's 100, 200, 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, whatever. But some people say that, I'm sorry, Acts of Thecla, where you, where you get the description, you know, there's not, it's not like there was a transformative period of where scroll writing was way more convenient then. So it does seem that there may be some reason for development later on, um, embellish, a tendency to embellish in general. Like, that doesn't strike me as too crazy. No, I do have to defend Gunko on one little point here, though. Um, he's comparing Genesis to later Old Testament works, such as the Deuteronomic history. That's which, true. Which does have more detail and other elements. So what, how would you explain those differences between Genesis and other more recent Old Testament books? That's another good point, the too. the materials change that much in that time period or not? Yeah, it makes you wonder if, you know, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that Genesis and Deuteronomy, when the, in the written form that we have in the, in the Torah, weren't written down too far apart. But maybe this, the stories of Genesis were actually much older and just had been passed down through in that form, in that terse form. And so that would explain some of the difference between why Genesis in general seems to be very unembellished, very efficient, whereas you get to the later books like Deuteronomy and stuff tends to be more descriptive. The stories, the narratives twist and turn and interweave and we get physical, more physical descriptions where related more information about the emotional state and the intentionality of the characters and things like that. So yeah, it's all all this stuff plays into it. It's really complicated, but I do think Shauna had a really good point. Yeah, um, really, really great point. Did you have something you were gonna about to say, Daniel? Okay. Um, I can't even read my own handwriting. Oh. Um, I guess this probably should have been included in chapter 2 where he goes through the types of legends, but he says a lot of the legends, their purpose is an instructive purpose. Um, let me flip to this actual part in the uh, book itself. If you go to a particular page, give us the page number. Okay, so yeah, sorry. Easier. And for, it, for anyone listening later now, Again, this Legends of Genesis by Herman Gunkel. It's available on archive.org. You can just search for Legends of Genesis, and you can read it right off of there. That's what I'm reading off of, so I will mention pages from now on. Thanks. Um, sorry, I'm just flipping through to try and find... Well, I can just think of an example. I think he used it um, in the Sodom and Gomorrah story. It was meant to be instructive in a way, like, you know, meant to underline the importance of hospitality and at the same time having fear of God, essentially. Um, I wish I could find the exact spot. He gave a bunch of examples. Anyway, that's another uh, factor he looks at. And then he talks about a later form, which he calls basically, an, the section's called an, earlier, an early Israelitish romance. I'll just read a real quick excerpt here. He says, out of the type of legends which has sketched an essential in preceding pages, so all the stuff we just talked about, there was evolved, as we may discover, even in Genesis itself, another type relatively much nearer to modern fiction. While the story of Hagar's flight is a classic instance of the former sort, the most conspicuous example of the second story, so this would be the romance, is of Joseph. It is necessary only to compare the two narratives in order to see the great differences in the two kinds. There, everything characteristically brief and condensed, here, in the case of Joseph, 
just as characteristically everything long spun out. So again, we have, um, in the case of Hagar's flight, very terse, very to the point, not much excessive extraneous detail. In Joseph's case, totally the exact opposite. Uh, just really expansionary and lots of detail and all that sort of stuff. So again, he, he's using this as he calls this a later romance in the in the form of the prose of, of these legends. Um, and uh, that's pretty much the gist of chapter three. But to be honest, my general feeling of this chapter, I was listening to it, uh, the audiobook that's available on LibriVox for free, and I was doing it while at work, and I, I found it pretty boring, to be honest with you. Um, I really should go back and reread it. And a lot of this stuff is, like we said, best best guess kind of stuff. Um, but he, he raised a lot of interesting points. But, yeah, basically, I need to reread it again to soak in more of it. So anyone closing thoughts on that, all the stuff we talked about, or anything in particular on Chapter 3? No? Okay. Not particularly, but I, I do want to interject a question. Sure. Um, just looking back at the big picture again. Did you say earlier that this is one of the first books on form criticism? I am actually find it surprising that the first book on form criticism would deal with, like, Genesis and, instead of something like Solemns, where the forms are more clear. Um, I'm not sure if this is the first book on form criticism, but I'm fairly certain, at least Wikipedia says and everything I've heard hmm. outside of Wikipedia says that Gunkel pretty much developed, founded form criticism as a as a as a critical approach to um, analyzing the text of the of the Bible. Yeah, I like the method. I just it seems harder to apply it in Genesis than other places. Like it seems easier to apply in Psalms and even in parts of the New Testament easier to apply. Yeah. Shauna brings up another good point. She says in regards to the details on Paul between Acts and Acts of Thecla. Um, what was the other Acts of Thecla and... I forget. Uh, it's Acts of Paul and Thecla. It's yeah, Paul and Thecla. Yeah, it's... Um... The, the problem with that, to keep it very brief, is that most scholars think that it was like uh, individual legends that were brought together into a single document called the Acts, um, the Acts of Paul. But within that document were all these different things where it's got the Thecla piece and the martyrdom of Paul and um, Paul's other little missionary adventures, and they all sort of come together. And it's within the Thecla piece that we actually get the first description of Paul. So. Okay, gotcha. So it seems to be mashing together disparate things. Yeah, Dennis McDonald's got a really good book called um, The Legend and the Apostle, um, which basically his theory is that it's uh, different, it's competing women's um, stories that are really informed this over against the Timothy writings that have said, you know, a woman should be quiet in church, and Thecla's much more, you know, she's um, ordained to be a, a teacher and preacher by the Apostle Paul himself. Then you've got these Timothy letters by Paul himself, which they're not, but, yeah. yeah. So they... Gotcha. So, um, anyway, Shauna was saying that in regards to the difference between Acts and Acts of Paul and Thecla, in the descriptive detail, Paul, she says it was between the 1st and 2nd century that Codex replaced scroll, allowing for more space, more room to embellish. So, um, I'm just reading that out because none of this stuff on the side chat will actually end up in the, in the uh, YouTube video, so I read it out. Um, so, Chapter 4. This chapter I really liked. This is a really great chapter. Um, this is called the historic, sorry, the history of the development of the legends of Genesis in oral tradition. Now, to me, in general, the chapter felt kind of a little bit bouncy, bounced around a little bit. 
Um, but lots of good information in it, which is why I, I really liked it. Um, Wayne, you said you started reading a little bit of it. What do you think so far before we start really digging into it? I don't really even know what to say. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I, enjoy, I enjoyed reading it, but I haven't really processed it in my head very much yet. Gotcha. Okay, no problem. So um, one of the first things he talks about... Now, he's talking about the, the development from the oral tradition state to what we have written down. Um, and the first thing he goes over is foreign influences um, of these legends. Uh, I'm just going to skim the text here to get to a couple parts that I wanted to highlight. Yeah, okay, so this is this is important for the, the cultural, geographical situation of Israel at the time. He says, Now if we recall that Israel lived upon a soul enriched by the civilization of thousands of years, that it lived by no means in a state of isolation, but was surrounded on all sides by races, he says, with superior culture. Th this book is definitely dated. Um, and if we consider further the international trade and intercourse of the early ages, which went from Babylonia to Egypt and from Arabia to the Mediterranean by way of Palestine. So in other words, they were kind of in the middle of a bunch of trade routes and a lot of activity going through that region from a bunch of different cultures are all surrounding them. Um, Anyway, sorry, by way of Palestine. We are warranted in assuming that this position of Israel among the nations will be reflected in its legends as well as in its language, which must be literally full of borrowed words. And then he makes an interesting point. Eventually I'd liken this group to read Wellhausen's uh, Prolegomena of the Old Testament, which is where he lays out the four source hypothesis, the documentary hypothesis. And he just has a quick thing I wanted to mention. That, um, on Wellhausen, he says, investigators hitherto, especially Wellhausen in his school, have erred frequently in assuming that the history of Israel could be interpreted almost exclusively from within, and in ignoring altogether too much of the lines which connect Israel with the rest of the world. So again, I haven't read Wellhausen's book. He may be misrepresenting him, I don't know, but I thought that was an interesting little note he put in there. Um... Yeah, so Babylonian influence. He's going to go through the different ones. Um, Babylonian influence is evident more than any other in the primitive legends. And then he goes on to talk about some specifics. Um, we can demonstrate in we can demonstrate this in the case of the legend of the of the flood. From I mean, just compare the ep, the floods the deluge story in the Epic of Gilgamesh to the flood story in in Genesis chapter six, right? I mean, just you, I won't even have to say anything. Just read them for yourself and see what you think. Um, and we have strong reasons for accepting it in the case of the story of creation. So there you'd want to read the Enuma Elish and then Genesis chapter 1 and 2, um, which agrees with the Babylonian story and the characteristic point of the division of the primeval sea into two portions so that the Tahome is divided via the creation of the earth with the firmament and the and the earth itself, dividing the sea above and below. Um, also in the legend of Nimrod, and I'm, I'm guessing he's... Nimrod was the hunter, the epic hunter of um, the Old Testament, and um, I'm guessing he's probably meaning that's kind of a parallel to... Um, not Marduk. Um, It would either be Gilgamesh or Enkidu, one of the two. Anyway, um, that would be an epic of Gilgamesh also. And in the tradition of the patriarchs, the ten. this is what I found really poignant. The ten patriarchs of the race as given by P, so that's a priestly source, being ultimately the same as the ten primitive kings of the Babylonians. Now, he, I've heard about this before. I haven't looked a ton into it, but... The, the ages of the patriarchs given in the in Genesis, if you look up the original ten um, kings of Babylon, there's a record. There's a super exact degree of the, the times that these kings ruled 
in succession with the length of how long the ten first ten patriarchs lived in the Old Testament. So, like, if you take the first Sumerian. patriarch... Of, sorry? It's Sumerian kings, not Babylonian kings. Oh, okay, then. He, he wrote Babylonians in here, so I, I guess he just fucked up. Yeah, it's S-U-M-E-R-I-A-N, Sumerian. Okay. Now, the Sumerian was the earlier... And, stage, and right? those are the ones that correspond to the patriarchs. And they also have in you know these really long range for these kings whose names are very similar to the patriarchs as they're listed in Genesis. Um, it's kind of plain, though, that some of those the ages of the patriarchs may be symbolic. For instance, you have Enoch lives 365 years, and he happens to be the founder of the solar calendar, you know, 365 days. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting things to play with there on that list. Yeah, some of them definitely seem to have a numerological significance. But yeah, the similarities of the names and the... And the the, the length, in the case of the patriarchs, how long they lived, and in the case of the Sumerian kings, the time of their reign. There's a, a really close match up there. But there's some discrepancy too, but it's really close. It kind of makes you wonder. Um, he says, the legend of the Tower of Babel too deals with Babylonia and must have its origins in that region. Um, the Iranian parallels to the legend of Paradise show that this too came from further east, but whether from Babylonia specifically is an open question. Um, he says there's Buddhistic parallel to the story of Sodom, and he gives a, a source, um, Kassel, it's a German title, Michel Sindbad. Um, uh, so that's some of the Babylonian influence. Um, he then goes on to say, any any thoughts on that in general, on that idea? Yeah, pretty straightforward. I think we've all heard that before, probably. Um, he goes on to talk about Egyptian and Phoenician influences. Um, he says the romance of Joseph, which has its scene partly in Egypt and very likely goes back to Egyptian legends. Um, he says, particularly evident in the legend of Joseph's agrarian policy. He says, um, we may well wonder that we find so few Egyptian elements in Genesis, but so far as we can see, the same observation is to be made for the civilization of Israel in general. Egypt was already a, a decadent nation and had but slight influence upon Canaan. Um, Phoenician influence as well, and Aramaic elements in the legends. Uh, the second is proven, the Aramaic is proven by the um, importance of the city of Haran to the patriarchs. The probable home of Ishmael, of the Ishmael legend is Ishmael and that of Lot, the mountains of Moab, where Lot's cave was shown. The Jacob Esau stories and the Jacob Laban stories were originally told in Jacob. The Shem Japheth Canaan legend in Shem, etc. And then he goes on to say that these legends were influenced by these legends from the surrounding cultures, which they were in constant contact with, um, would have been retrofitted and kind of reworked to serve a different purpose. So a lot of the narrative elements would have been the same, very similar, but it would have served a different rhetorical purpose or religious function. Um, Any thoughts on any of that so far? Sorry, I'm just skimming the text again. And then he goes on to say, between the source, between the Elohist and priestly sources, they avoid calling the God of the Patriarchs Yahweh, 
in which we may see a last relic of the feeling that these stories really have nothing to do with Yahweh, the God of Israel. As furthermore, the book of Job, which also treats a foreign theme, does not use the name Yahweh. But even in the third source, J, which speaks of Yahweh, the name Yahweh Zabaoth is not found. On a few occasions, we were able to catch the name of the pre yahvistic God of the legend. We hear of El Lahai Roy at Lahai Roy, um, of El Olam at Beersheba, of El Bethel at Bethel, of El Shaddai and El Elyon are probably also such primitive names. I, I want to make a quick note on that. Sure. In that David um, Friedman points out that the P source does mention Yahweh by name um, before the time of Moses, but only by the narrator. The point is that the characters don't know that name, but the narrator himself does use it a couple of times. And that's okay. actually, that, 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 that's not an exception to the rule. Friedman points out that that is the rule. Okay. So it's only used The, the, the idea narrator. is that the God revealed that name to Moses. Okay, yeah. The narrator writing after that would know it, but none of the characters before Moses should know that. But that's only in the P source. The other sources do not follow that rule. And that's one of the that's one of the determining factors of what is in the P source. Gotcha. Um, Shauna says there's an interesting chapter on the Sumerian kings list in a book called Noah's Ark and the Zisudra, I guess I don't know if Zusudra, Zisudra epic um, by Robert M. Best. Uh, and then he says there's some Greek parallels as well. The story of the three men who visit Abraham is told among the Greeks by Hyrius of Tanagra. Um, that comes from Ovid. Um, the story of Potiphar's wife contains the same fictional motive as that of Hippolytus and Phaedra, and is found in other forms. There are also Greek parallels for the story of the curse upon Reuben, that comes out of the Iliad, and for the story of the quarrel of the brothers Esau and Jacob, and that comes from um, Apollodor, from uh, Biblioth. The legend of Lot at Sodom suggests that of Philemon and Bacchus, in the legends of the beginnings, also there are related features. The declaration that man and women were originally one body comes from Plato's Symposium. And the myth of the Elysian happiness of the primeval time are also familiar to the Greeks. So that brings up the question of whether we follow Gunkel in thinking that the Greek and Hebrew versions came from a common source or some of the biblical minim minimalists who basically say the Bible got it from the Greeks and was written late. And I don't know how to decide that myself. I'm not, not as adept in the study to know. But. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, could we, could we ever settle it? I don't know. Um, so yeah, then he goes into the, the, the adaptation of the legends, which I kind of already talked about. Um, he goes into some really great specifics, though. Like, he talks about the difference, even though there's clear narrative similarities between the Deluge stories and the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and Genesis, they serve a different function completely. Um, and he talks about how the, how the legends have been refigured and reorganized, and, you know, they, they serve a different function, essentially. Um, I'm just kind of skimming through again. Sorry, forgive me. He also says that within these legends, there seem to be 
editings where um, the, basically they've uh, they've undergone editing and redactions as they've been transmitted through the ages essentially and he, he goes into a bunch of examples where he feels like things have been put in that seem out of place or inconsistent or break break the narrative flow of the of the particular story stuff like that On that note, I find it kind of interesting that the story of Dinah um, features the prince of Shechem, and during the Persian period, there was quite a rivalry between the sect in Jerusalem and the people in Shechem, and even and, uh, Ezra even broke up some marriages and forbade the the you know people intermarrying with that crowd down there in Shechem who were I guess the the ancestors of what we now call the Samaritans and so then we get this story here where hey don't let your daughter marry intermarry with those people in Shechem not even if she's gonna be the queen of the city and it features of course you know the the Levites who are the ones who I think it's pretty obvious we're meant to be minders at least if not before the Persian period definitely after the Persian period I mean you look at the way they've been carved out and given a little plot of land in every group amongst every tribe right and their priests who do the the butchering of the animals and prepare them for sacrifice and so you know hey they're they're making sure that everybody is turning in their taxes and um, butchering their animals in the prescribed way and put you know turning in that that uh let's say the the first the first fruits you know because they're not a member of the tribe they're an outsider and their livelihood depends on these sacrifices and taxes and stuff and so I think that they were purposefully there as minders and so you know hey if you go out and you and, and you intermarry with these wrong people the minders the Levites are going to come on down and slaughter you I guess that's just one way of looking at um, that particular story from a minimalist point of view. Yeah, that would that harkens back to the the rhetorical function a lot of these stories had, um, kind of the cautionary lessons essentially. Um, there's another great one in the in the names of this is more ethnological, but in the names of the um, sons of the daughters of Lot. They're uh, I forget what the actual names are, but essentially they they're really like one of them means like son of the father, which you know, considering they slept with their dad, like they, they seem to be really derogatory names and meant to be putting down these tribes of people. Yeah, Ben Ami, uh, Ammon, son of the father. Um, and Moab, I forget exactly what Moab means, but something similar to seed of the father. So again, like, you know, in the story, Lot's daughters have sex with them, they have kids that are end up being named son of the father, seed of the father. It's kind of like, yeah, these are literary. I mean, it seems obvious that they're just literary constructions and and in the same time at the same time meant to denigrate and insult Moabites and Ammonites who were people that Israelites did not get along with you know um, 
then he he goes on to talk about God, God's relation to man. He says, Genesis furnishes the most varied utterances concerning the religion of the divinity to mankind. The relation of the divinity to mankind, sorry. In the oldest legends, we hear how God holds men in check, how he guards and favors certain individuals in accordance with his sovereign pleasure, and how he glorifies and aggrandizes his people above others. In certain of the oldest legends, God's actions in such cases seem not to involve at all any thought of the moral or religious attitude of men. God reveals himself to Jacob at Bethel simply because Jacob happens to come to Bethel. Simil similarly, at Penuel, the divinity assails Jacob without any... God is pleased with... Um, is that right? That's where he wrestles them, right? At Penuel? I think that's right. Um... Uh, God is pleased with Abel's offering simply because he loves Abel the shepherd. He protects Abraham in Egypt and gives a fortunate uh, outcome to the patriarch's deception. So in that story, um, Abraham deceives Pharaoh, you know, saying that Rebekah is his sister. I'm sorry, Sarah, right? I always get them mixed up. Is his sister, and, you know, he takes her into the harem and... Uh, God ends up punishing Pharaoh, even though basically Abraham lied about it, essentially. Um, Isn't that one of the stories that occurs multiple times, at least twice, I think three times that, that story? Yeah, Abraham does it twice. The first time he, he, just, he just flat out lies. And the second time it's with the Amalekites, king of the Amalekites. He says that Oh, actually, uh, she's my half sister. So you know, I, I think that was put in there to get Abraham out of lying, personally, out of being a just a bald-faced liar. Um, and then it happens again with um, Abraham's son, who I can't remember his name right now, but he does the exact same thing. You know, his 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 wife's super beautiful, lies. She gets taken into the harem. God gets pissed off and punishes the uh, king, etc. And this is clearly a case where there were two or three different versions of a legend floating around and people were so entrenched in their version that they had to include all three. Yeah, I think that's a, a great argument. Like, I have had discussions with people that are saying that well, no, actually, all this these all happen just like that. It's, it seems really far fetched to think that all of these happen. These three separate occasions happen so similarly. Just seems far fetched. Same thing in the Gospels, like the the, the feeding of the multitudes twice. Um, yeah, same type of thing. I think. If I'm going to interject. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, though, those two different feedings. The numbers are different. Yeah. And the, the interpretation of the numbers makes sense in a way as one of the feedings dealing with Israel, because the number 12 occurs there, and the other feeding dealing with the Gentiles in Rome, where the number 7 appears regarding like the seven hills of Rome. And there's other details in the numbers that make commentators think that there's two different you know, groups being referenced there symbolically. Right, but I think those what you describe would only go to underline the fact that they're creations rather than historical. Yes, things. yes. But yeah, that, those are great details. I didn't even realize that. That's a good point. Are those, the, the 12 in relation to Israel and the 7 in relation to Rome, are those, do those happen in Luke and, and Matthew too? I know that the numbers of loaves and fishes are the same between the synoptics, between the two stories, but I don't remember the 12 and 7 thing. I think I it's 12, it baskets of, 12 baskets of bread or something like that, right? I don't remember offhand. I have to look it up. Okay. Um, so I, I don't remember that 12 or 7 thing at all. Um, I'm going to have to check that out myself. I'm, I'm guessing, Wayne, that comes from the article you sent me about uh, Mark being the Gospel of Mark in general being an allegorical work. Yeah, I think our R. G. Price mentions that there, but it's okay. been a while since I've read it, so I'm not, I'm not totally sure. But I think he mentions that. Yeah, that difference. 
and that explanation for the difference. Gotcha. So, okay, so going off of what I had described before where God seems to favor certain individuals regardless of the inherent morality of their actions or whatever, like in the case of Abraham deceiving Pharaoh and saying that Sarah was his sister. Um, uh, he goes on and says, but alongside these are other legends upon a higher plane according to which God makes his favor to depend upon the righteousness of men. He destroys sinful Sodom, but saves Lot because of his hospitableness. He destroys the disobliging Onan. That's a guy who stole the seed, which is not about masturbation, anyway. Um, and exiles Cain because of his fratricide. Joseph is helped by him because he has deserved assistance by his uh, chastity and his magnanimity. Um, to Abram he gives a son because of his kindness to strangers. So these legends all belong taken absolutely to a later time which has a finer ethical sense, yet they are all primitive in Israel. So again, he, a lot of this book is he's kind of trying to lay out tools for, for identifying more primitive forms of a particular story or parts of a story and what he feels are later characteristics. So, and again, then he goes on and he ta he's, there's a section called Not Merely a Tribal God. So there are a lot of the stories where God is just all about Israel and that's all that matters. But then we also find legends that he says are probably later where God judges Israel and and it, again, it becomes more moralistic and ethically concerned rather than just purely tribal. Um, he, he talks about religious and profane motives mingled. Um, the legend of the deluge praises not only the piety but also the shrewdness of Noah in the story of his sending out of the birds. The legend of the flight of Hagar gives quite a bit, quite a realistic picture of the condition of affairs in Abraham's household, and then tells of God's assistance. Um, so he's saying that in a lot of these legends, you'll get the the, the relay together, and he goes on to expound on that. Um, and again, it basically increasing trend of ethical um, notions. Uh, he makes special mention of the fact that the patriarchs aren't portrayed to be saints. You know, they're not perfect. A lot of them do, like in the case of Abraham, they're not. They're not necessarily ethical exemplars. They have flaws, and um, you know, they're not perfect. Um, and uh, okay, so yeah, that's basically the gist of chapter four. Oh, one one other thing, he says he's got an interesting section called "Patriarchs Disguised Divinities." He says, still another question is whether these tribal names were not also originally names of divinities, as for instance, Asher is at the same time the name of the god Asher from Assyria. This is to be assumed for Gad, which is at the same time the name of the god of also for Edom, um, the name Obed Edom, servant of Edom. Names of divinities have been suspected further in Selah, um, the name Methuselah, which means man of Selah. Um, Reuel, Reu, Reuel, he's got a really weird notation there. It's like a R with a tiny little E and then an apostrophe, if that's an E. Anyway, I'm just going to say Reuel. Rea, Reuel. Uh, Nahor, the name Ebed Nahor, Servor. Terra, perhaps the name as the North Syrian god Teru. Haran, the name Beth Haran, Temple of Haran. So again, it seems like the patriarchs have really striking similarities to um, neighboring divinities. And so, yeah, basically that is the gist of chapter four.
essentially. It seems a lot to do with um, foreign influence and the, the development, how they developed out of oral tradition to what we find um, now in the books as we have them. Oh, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, basically that's chapters three and four. So we had the literary forms of the legends and then the historical development of oral tradition to the forms we have them in now. So uh, the uh, them being reconfigured and repurposed for Israelite religion, essentially. So any closing thoughts on those those two main categories? What, um, Wayne, what do you think so far in general of if if you if you have any thoughts, you don't have to say anything, but thoughts so far on chapters three and four in general. Um, a lot of this is a little bit over my head and I'm just Mine too. Getting into this <laughs> kind of just fresh and I I need to read some of this two or three times over to really think about some of it and actually read Genesis at the same time a couple of times through and compare things. So Yeah, I there's a, lot totally of, there's a lot of things here that will probably stay in my mind next time I read Genesis that, oh, okay, yeah, I remember Gunkel mentioned that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think, would be... I think a lot of what he says is really plausible, but there might be other theories that are also plausible that you have to pick, so... Yeah, and he actually ends Section 4 with a a section called Caution Needed in Interpretation. He says... But before we are warranted in declaring with regard to a figure in Genesis that it bears the impress of an earlier god, we must... Oh, I'm sorry. I got this confused. This is just to deal with the um, the names of the patriarchs equaling names of other gods. But in general, he... I forget where it was. Maybe it was in Chapter 2, actually. He... About taking a, a, an approach of caution when um, trying to argue some of these things definitively. So he, he, in some sense he does hedge a little bit his certainty on these, on his classifications. And he ends chapter 4 with an interesting note. He says, um, Meditative apologetics is wont to lay great importance upon the historical verity of Abraham. In our opinion, there is no longer any room for this assumption, and moreover, it is hard to see what significance this position can have for religion and the history of religion. For even if there had once been a leader by the name of Abraham, as is generally believed, and who conducted the migration from Haran to Canaan, this much is beyond question with everyone who knows anything of the history of legends, that a legend cannot be expected to preserve throughout so many centuries a picture of the personal piety of Abraham. The religion of Abraham is in reality the religion of the narrators of the legends ascribed by them to Abraham. And just as a side note, a, a lot of people have the same view of Jesus, essentially, that especially in the Gospel of John, like it seems like, um, it's basically Christian religion being put into the mouth of Jesus, essentially, a lot of it. So same kind of thing here is what they're arguing. So anyway, we're done with the readings for those sections. So we're going to finish up the books next time, the book next time, which will deal chapter 5, which is um, Yahvist, Elohist, Yehovist, and later collections. So he, he does this weird um, comparison of the different sources in his um, way of separating them out. Um, that's chapter 5, and then uh, chapter 6, uh, the Priestly Codex and the Final, re final Redaction, or Final Redactor. Um, so I think those will be fun chapters. They're not too long. It's about half as much reading as we just had this last week. So... So, quick question then. Um, yeah. When he gives these different collections, is he using different terminology for the same sources that are like mentioned by Friedman, or is he giving a different document hypothesis that's different from like Wilhausen and Friedman? You know, I, when I first read this book, it was a long time ago, and he does basically use, as far as I remember, he basically does use Fellhausen's classifications. But he, he also gives some criticisms in certain ways and does 
have his own labels for certain sections too. Um, I was wondering if one of these names is just like the same thing as Deuteronomic or something. Oh, possibly. You mean like Ye Yehovist, maybe yeah, a Deuteronomic. Know, yeah. yeah, maybe D. Yeah, possibly. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, but this, I think this will be a fun last section. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a... I definitely need to reread Chapter 3, soak it in more. It seems to be much more speculative in a lot of cases. Chapter 4 seems very solid to me, and a lot of good stuff in there. And again, this is just for people who haven't done the reading or are just watching and don't intend to read it. This is just a really broad, point-by-point -point overview of this stuff. He, On all these points, he goes into much greater detail on laying out why he thinks the way he does on all these things. So, you know, if, 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 if what I'm saying or what any of us is saying seems like um, too little, it's expounded upon in the book. So if, you, if you're curious, you can find it all in there. So, which, and again, it's free. The book's available free. It's in the public domain um, on archive.org. So. Yeah, even though I was a little vague on my opinion of it, and I was vague on kind of what I got out of it, I'm still really glad we read it. I mean, this, I found it really interesting. Yeah, and, and from what I remember, I found the last two chapters the most interesting. So I think the best is yet to come as far as getting into the real nitty-gritty detail of of the uh, form-critical approach. And, and in this case, in the, in the cases of Chapter 5 and 6, really focusing on form criticism and how it relates to um, the four sor source hypothesis. But I'm pretty sure when I go back to reading Genesis again, or the next time I read it, um, that some of the points he's made in these chapters will, will be in my mind and I'll start noticing things. It's, it's going to forever change the way I look at Genesis. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I agree. And I, th I do think the best way to read this book would be read Genesis quickly do it all in one or two shots, you know, a day or two, couple nights, do it, and then pick up this book and read it and have Genesis right there with you and check all this stuff out. You know, going going back, I should have done that, you know, originally. That's the best way to really get the most out of this book, and I probably will eventually go back and do it that way. Because it's nice to have the material of Genesis fresh in your head, you know, because sometimes he'll only make passing reference to a particular story you know, and he doesn't go into detail because he expects you to be familiar with the uh, the details of the of the narrative in Genesis. So, anyway, anyone have any other closing thoughts? Um, okay, so um, we're gonna do this again uh, next week. Sunday at 7, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we'll be reading chapters 5 and 6. So for any of you who are, are watching this after we've done it or who are here now, and by the way, feel free to come even if you don't want to do the reading or haven't done it. That's not a requirement. I mean, obviously it's nice if you have the time to, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, next week, chapters 5 and 6, Legends of Genesis, 7 p.m. Pacific. And uh, that'll be the end of this book. And uh, next time, so the Sunday after next, we'll be starting a New Testament book called Parables of War, reading John's Jewish, Jewish Apocalypse by John W. Marshall. And in that book, he basically lays out a case that... Uh, he lays out his case for why he thinks... Um, uh, Revelation, rather than coming out of originally coming out of a Christian um, origin, actually originated from a, a Jewish apocalyptic um, origin, essentially to be redundant. So anyway, um, you can take us out anytime you want, Reuben. <laughs>